Hi, welcome to Detours Understanding Acquired Brain Injury. Uh, this is the final of our four part series of irritability, anger, and aggression. Um, I may have just a little, um, like just additional information later on that I will add, but this is the last part in our series. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes of you know what what we're looking at we addressed earlier um the difference kind of between irritability and aggression and we talked about pharmacological methods which act as an adjunct but this is really a major way of dealing with it and this is how therapists often deal with it and the important thing to keep in mind when addressing irritability and aggression is that when you're dealing with, for example, your own kids or with a situation like that where we often see as people are learning to deal with it, it's that you teach appropriate ways of behaving as one is growing up. And people after brain injury may forget or lose um, the ability to control their own behavior or may not quite understand the context because of cognitive problems. And so a lot of this and a lot of what we use in order to help a person following traumatic and acquired brain injury is um, classic methods that are used when working with your kids. They're not as formalized and it's not as in some previous eras, not as physical perhaps, um, but it certainly involves a lot of the psychological principles, um, classic behaviorism, Skinner. And in fact, you find that the second letter for CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but we find that, well, we use the kind of rehabilitative techniques. And so we're going to be talking about things that we focus on and things that you can do as a family when working with a loved one who's having problems with aggression, hitting, biting, kicking, spitting. And the thing to know about Aggression is that it is something that is measurable, and this is important. It is a behavior that is, a behavior is, by definition, measurable. Irritability has components of showing anger, things like that, and that would be also measurable, but it also has internal components, and that's why CBT has the cognitive, because you're expressing thoughts as well. The things we're mainly concerned with our behaviors and acting out um and so when we're dealing with how to deal with it we're more concerned about the person's physical acting out um the medications can help with mood regulation things like that and emotional regulation a person after a traumatic brain injury would have problems with those aspects and those you can help with medication and act as an adjunct if someone's having problems thinking but the things we're worried about especially in context of family or therapy or working or anything along those lines we're interacting with society is a necessity we're worried about more about behavior and how to fix you know somebody who punches a because they're angry because somebody was in line ahead of them or maybe throws a drink or something like that. A patient who's got that problem. Worried about decreasing those kind of behaviors. And again, it's important to remember all behavior is communication. Let me say that again because it is really important. All behavior is communication of some sort. The trick is to find out what. Is it communicating something complicated or is it rather basic pain um, confusion or is it complicated like hey I want to earn money um, by doing this um, so let's get into the different ways and approaches um, I do want to stress that if you're using these kind of techniques at home everyone has to be on the same page you can't have two or three different family members saying no no you're not doing that right with Uncle Jimmy you no everyone's got to be together because if you cannot work together on approaching a behavioral problem using behavioral techniques it's not going to work um the efforts are divided uh so everyone's got to find a way to cooperate and work together 
in order to use these kind of techniques. All right, I'm gonna stress that everyone's got to be on the same page or, and y you, you would have to talk to those who are not supportive. And if they're not part of the primary caregivers, maybe you have to exclude them. I'm not saying absolutely, but I am saying if they cannot agree, perhaps they have to be excluded. Um, that's a decision that each family would have to make, but with the understanding that um, if you cannot work together, then you have to make a decision because it is an absolute necessity that everyone is on the same page. Because many of the problematic behaviors that emerged in the first place were due to accidental reinforcement of that given behavior. Uh, if somebody acts out and somebody in the family gives in, they are reinforcing that behavior. They are saying this is how you should act in order to get something that you want. Um, and so avoiding that um, kind of incidental accidental reinforcement is critical. All right. So first, let's talk about some of the basic principles uh, behind basic Skinnerian behaviors. A reinforcer whether positive or negative, increases the likelihood of a behavior to recur, right? So the, a negative reinforcer still increases the likelihood of a behavior. I, I taught abnormal psych for a little bit, and oftentimes this was a point of confusion. A negative reinforcer increases the likelihood of a behavior. It works by taking away something that is aversive, that is bad, or that is a distasteful to a person. So if you take away homework for getting in line quietly, doing the things you're supposed to, you increase the behavior, which is what you want, getting in line, being quiet. It's like, hey, you did a good job lining up. You don't have to do the worksheet, okay? So you're taking away something that is aversive, doing that worksheet, for getting in line quietly. So it is a negative reinforcer. It increases the behavior, getting in line, by taking away that worksheet. So negative reinforcer. Take away something aversive to increase a behavior. Now, a positive reinforcer is give the kid candy for getting in line, okay? And it applies to adults. A uh, positive reinforcer, pay them for working. Um, negative reinforcer, you don't have to come to work on Friday. Your day is off because, you know, you're employee of the month. Okay, negative reinforcer. Take away, don't have to come in, take it away for being employee of the month, all right? So reinforcers, important. Punishers, punishers are to apply an aversive stimulus in order to decrease a behavior. Positive punishers, smack on the bottom, electric shock, you know, something bad applied to decrease the behavior with a goal of decreasing it. Positive punishers, they, mm, it's complicated. They don't always work like you would expect um, because we're more than just simply behavior and response. We're not Pavlov's dogs. We have cognitions and some people, you know, being um, I'll show you and increase the behavior. Now, of course, if you do it enough, if you shock somebody enough, eventually they will stop. But we'll, we'll get to extinction bursts in a little bit. Um, then there is negative punishers time out you act up we put you in the corner that is to apply an aversive stimulus time away from stimulation time away from stuff you like for acting up okay now something important to keep in mind you have to know what the person does not want what they do not like because maybe time alone is exactly what they're looking for so you have to know what would be a negative reinforcer and a negative punisher so maybe that time away is exactly what they're looking for so maybe if you know uncle jimmy who's you know doing pt finds out that you're going to take him out of the pt gym if he starts yelling and screaming and you're thinking it's going to be a negative punisher by taking him away and he finds it's uncomfortable and he doesn't want to do it remember all behaviors communication you take him out of there you're actually rewarding him for this behavior. And this happens a lot in families because they don't know. And so the first step is to examine what the behavior is. And is it communicating discomfort? Is he tired? Is Uncle Jimmy tired? 
maybe and so what you need to do is first of all find out is he trying to communicate something guarantees communicating something and so when you see somebody acting up acting out know what they're trying to communicate with their behavior whether it's aggression irritability whatever find out second if you're going to try to replace a behavior using you know either reinforcers or punishers know exactly what it is you're going to try to to replace it with um so because you have to offer an alternative behavior because otherwise you're going to drift right back to what it was they were doing before so providing an alternative is important too um and in this case um rather than acting out maybe raise his hand say i need a break in the pt gym again same idea hey i need a break please and doing that providing that that he can learn and then over time you might lengthen the amount of time he has to do but in the beginning yeah okay take him out he raises his hand and he's rewarded by you doing that and maybe if he acts out it's much longer before you take him out. Maybe you take him to the gym later when there are fewer people there that he'll disturb at different time. And if he starts acting out, he has to wait longer. And you'd have to explain that too. Hey, you know, if you act appropriately, if you raise your hand and say, I need a break, he leaves much quicker as opposed to he starts screaming, acting out. It's like, I'm sorry. And, you know, you just... Um, obviously, it's not, not a perfect solution, but it does, it is one of the ways to help. There are other things you could do, too. And um, this technique is one of the primary ways to work with somebody. And you also need to make sure that you are recording and writing down what you see specifically. You're looking for, and this is where help of what's called a certified applied behavior analyst can help. They are specialists in psychology, but they have extra training beyond that. And they're good at like looking for things, clues that come with, they're kind of behavioral detectives. They look for clues that come around with given behaviors. And they can say, wait a minute, I see these other clues that come ahead of time that suggest that maybe Jimmy's also having, um, maybe he's not only having pain, but he's also feeling sick to his stomach. Uh, maybe he's confused. Maybe there's too much stimulation. And so you could do things ahead of time to reduce. And so that's why maybe taking him later or earlier before anyone else goes reduces the amount of overload. And so you can do things ahead of time or in order to reduce some of these other stimuli and reduce the need to use a lot of those kind of interventions applying punishers and rewards and you know all that kind of stuff and make it simpler and maybe just nip the problem in the bud before it even becomes serious or you can another one of the things is if you're working with somebody who has persistent problems you need to tell them these are going to be the consequences and you need to lay it out straight um if you start swinging at somebody if you hit at somebody you know, the, you will be moved and we will leave and you'll be left alone for, you know, it's a more serious kind of intervention, but at home, um, screaming, yelling, whatever, everyone's going to leave you and you're not going to get, you know, the attention you're looking for. And you need to lay it out. You need to lay out the consequences for your actions. You need to lay out what a better alternative is and a reward. And it's also important to be positive as well say if you do this this is you know what we offer um again offering those alternatives too um it's also important that when you are looking at behavioral techniques to consider cognitive capacity is a person confused um don't always assume that it is an intention an intentionality that they are trying to cause problems or harm or Many times they don't understand. And so you do need to break it down into small pieces and say, you know, this, this, and this is not acceptable. Need to spell it out. Okay. Um, many people fairly soon or even a while after brain injury still don't understand the rules, don't understand the situation. And if their cognition is too impaired, I talk about medication in episode three. 
Um, and so medications are necessary and they may help in those areas uh, with to improve cognition, focus, things like that. And they may be do better along with these behavioral interventions. Also, some people tend to be more irritable and aggressive as their baseline. That just is their behavior to begin with. And so you need to treat the underlying disorder. Um, that's how they were before. And this is just a reemergence. And so, again, you need to kind of stick to reinforcers, punishers, that kind of thing. And so I just want to stress that, you know, how you handle that, um, those coexisting those comorbidities will also affect how successful you are with this too um also two other things one is shaping one of the things we do to increase the likelihood of behavior is you reward successive approximations of the desired behavior many times it's too much of a leap especially with brain injury patients and so what you need to do is reward closer and closer behavior to what you want Maybe Uncle, Uncle Bill can't do, Uncle Will can't do, um, can't stay in the PT gym for long enough to really get much done. So you'll reward him just sitting in there in a the chair or whatever for three minutes. And he earns some reward. And this would apply to whatever. Maybe um, sitting quietly and as if you have to trim uh, Aunt Jane's nails. I, I, I don't know sitting quietly for three minutes and then once that's successfully achieved then the next step having you know scissors land there you sitting there of course for safety but you know scissors there and then you reinforce after that successfully achieved cutting them you know just cutting a single nail and then you reinforce that and then you reinforce cutting two nails with a reward and you if they fail then maybe withdraw something desirable. And again, this is why taking notes is so important. Recording is so important. You know what is a reward? You know what is a punisher? Or you withdraw a reward. You could maybe use a token economy, which is where they could earn points or earn credits towards taking a trip. Maybe they're like going somewhere. Um, these kind of things. This is how you use Skinnerian behaviorism to help work and you slowly reward with shaping closer and closer approximations towards what it is you want um you could use money outright money is a token economy after all it's green paper or numbers on a card it doesn't mean anything um it only means something because we we agree it means something it's a what's called a fiat economy uh because we say so um, it's the same thing. You can make tokens worth something. Um, but what matters is that they can understand that and they understand that they can trade it. And then you can use it. You can find them for bad behavior. They use it in classrooms all the time. We use it in universities. We just call them grades. That is a fiat economy too. Um, it is important to keep these things in mind um, that we need to be a little creative when it comes to helping a person and using these behavioral techniques. Also, um, it won't always generalize. So it is important that when you are trying to use these techniques to do them in as close to the realistic setting as possible when you are working with somebody. So if you're trying to help um, say Uncle Billy not to hit somebody with his cane in the mall maybe he's taking a fancy like doing that to watching somebody like trip or whatever you need to work with him in that type of setting because the closer it is to the original setting the more likely it is to stick for that setting and remember people with brain injury many of us have trouble with short-term memory so it is key that we work in that type of a setting also sometimes you will see a sudden surge of the undesirable behavior if it was being used to get attention or something along those lines remember how i said all behavior is communication 
if they were using it that way to manipulate somebody, there's going to be a huge surge in that behavior before it is what's called extinct. Extinction with behavior is when they're going to try one last desperate time to get attention or to use it to manipulate or whatever, even if it's unintentionally learned. They're going to try really hard to, you know, and then it then it finally goes. Now, sometimes you'll see a resurgence, you know, throughout time, still hoping it works. It's kind of like pulling the arm on a slot machine. Try, 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 try. Oops, I got one. Try, 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 try. It's called intermittent reinforcement. And many families do exactly the worst thing, which is intermittent reinforcement. Sometimes they'll give in to Uncle Billy. Sometimes they won't. And that's intermittent reinforcement. And that is exactly the worst thing because it encourages him to keep trying until he gets what he wants. And so it requires consistently no. And so that's basically the essence of strict behaviorism. Now, of course, cognitive therapy helps work with the thinking skills and saying, gee, why doesn't this work? Why is this not a good approach? Why is it not good to hit somebody? And somebody with higher level processing can learn to understand why, you know, aggression is bad, why being irritable and snappy with somebody is bad, especially if it is behavior that was learned and their cognition as it improves, time will help, but it requires a kind of focus and it requires that kind of mental development and it requires that kind of awareness and many people with brain injury do have trouble with those kind of executive skills and again medication can help um add adhd medicine can help focus amantadine we talked about these but can help improve that focus and to help that improving with therapy and kind of fix some of those cognitive misapperception errors or those perceptual mistakes and help them understand that and this is where that negative attribution bias that assumption that you're perfect everyone else is seriously flawed and you know help fix that because that is a serious problem and it really needs to be fixed and a realization yeah i'm wrong Every, the whole world isn't against me it's on the edge of paranoia almost that negative attribution bias not quite but it's close and realizing that most people just are neutral or don't care um and dealing with those kind of issues it's complicated it's not easy and why working with a therapist perhaps to find a solution for your loved one at home asking hey what are things we can do what are behavioral techniques we can use because they are important and the key really it's the the butter for your bread here to help fix the aggressive behavior the anger the irritability that's really where the answers come from is from here and then you apply the medication to help with unique circumstances things that maybe you can't quite reach to bridge that gap um so that that is is the way that behaviorism can be used effectively and techniques like at home and things that the therapist will use obviously there's more to it than that it, it does represent a full certification, but these are a lot of things like you could do at home or you can do with therapists and that you'll see them using. Um, there are things you could do with timers and all kinds of other things. I'm not going to get into that since this is more survey, but I did want to make it clear that there are a lot of non-medication things you can do. And in this case, just like in dealing with empathy or um, like the adynamia and some of those kind of things, behavioral techniques come to the fore. And the medication is kind of in the back seat because a lot of these skills we learned as kids. And so fixing these problems, repairing these kind of deficits, comes through cognitive and behavioral rehabilitation. All right? Um, we hope you enjoyed this series. Um, found it instructive and helpful and provided some answers for your for your loved one or yourself and are able to use some of the information here please comment below if you found anything helpful or if you have any suggestions for families that are struggling um also please like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this 
and uh, have a good day and see you in the next episode.